Hey everyone, thanks for joining today's uh, University Finance Lab Hangout. Uh, the topic today is the impact of finance labs and student learning. My name is Ryan Kohoy with Rise Vision and I'll be moderating today's panel. Uh, if you want to ask questions as we get going through this, you'll notice there's a toolbar to the right-hand side of your video window and a big green button that says, Ask a New Question. Uh, we want to make this a lively, interactive uh, conversation. So as we get going through this, if you want us to expand on any topics, you have any thoughts, any different directions you'd like us to take, feel free to throw those questions in there. And as questions are coming in, feel free to vote them up so that we can uh, get different perspectives of what's popular and what you guys want to want to hear about. Um, as I mentioned, this is all focused around the topic of University Finance Labs. If you haven't had a chance, check out the universityfinancelab.com website. It's a resource site that was put together and there's a lot of great tools out there. Uh, first off, if you have a lab, check out the directory and check out your listing. And if we have anything incorrect or there's anything that can be expanded on, uh, please feel free to uh, throw that information in there. Uh, and let us know. If you do have a lab and you don't see us listed in the directory, uh, let us know. We want to make sure and get this as accurate as possible. I think right now we're tracking about 315 labs in North America. Uh, in addition to the directory out on the website, there, there's a lot of other information such as partners, people that help contribute different tools to make these labs come together. There's a great gallery of photo examples of labs in action if you're looking at trying to get some different ideas of what you could do for your finance lab. Uh, we've tried to collect a number of different research papers, whether that's articles that have been written, research papers, presentations. Um, so, you know, check those out. If you have something and you'd like to submit it to us, uh, again, please share. Um, but, you know, please consider that a resource as you're looking through things. And then uh, another area is the Hangouts. And that's, uh, this is really kind of the first of what we're trying to launch in 2015. Our goal is to have a Hangout uh, each month going throughout the year so that we can bring together best practices and ideas. So if you have ideas for a Hangout, uh, again, please share. If you'd like to contribute or be part of any of these Hangouts uh, and share your knowledge, uh, please reach out to us. We're always looking for you know, different resources to help put these, uh, these sessions on. Coming up, what we're targeting in February is to talk about simulation tools. In March, talking about how to design labs for those that maybe don't have one yet. Um, in April, talking about the investment side of things and leveraging tools like Morningstar to manage uh, investment funds. Uh, and then in May, talking about bringing the real world of financial services into a classroom and some of the certification programs that are out there. Um, another resource uh, for those of you that attend AACSB, the annual conference is coming up in April in Tampa. And uh, a collection of companies has come together under the you know, University Finance Lab umbrella. And there's going to be a 20 foot by 20 foot booth there with a mock trading room set up. Desks, chairs, uh, tickers, wall boards, simulation programs, uh, a lot of the different pieces that you see. And there's going to be 15 minute presentations throughout the entire conference. So you can stop in, uh, listen, learn a little bit about some of these different components. So whether you have a lab and you're just looking at better ways to utilize it, or maybe you're interested in creating something, uh, you know, if, if you are attending AACSB, make sure and put that on your agenda to stop by the Finance Lab uh, booth that's there. So I want to get jumping into the panel that we've assembled today to talk about, uh, you know, the learning side of things. Uh, joining me on the panel is Kevin Mack. He's the director of the Real-Time Analysis and Investment Lab, also known as RAIL, at Stanford Graduate School of Management. Um, for those of you that haven't met Kevin in the past, uh, he's you know, been to a number of conferences, he speaks, he writes papers. Um, prior to landing at Stanford here a couple years back, he was very instrumental in putting the lab together um, at Rotman School of Business at the University of Toronto. So uh, we look forward to getting Kevin's perspective on a lot of the topics here. Also joining us is Bruce Weber. He's the Dean at Lerner College of Business and Economics at University of Delaware. Uh, Bruce, uh, prior to landing as the Dean at uh, Delaware, was at uh, the, school of, the London School of Business. And prior to that, where I originally met, Bruce was at uh, Baruch in New York, where he was instrumental in helping to create uh, that lab well over 10 years ago now. So uh, another great resource in terms of seeing how these labs have grown up over the years. And then last but not least on our panel is Jennifer, Jennifer Mulcarek, who's the Program Director of the Investment Center at Duquesne University. 
Uh, and Jennifer has been involved in their program for well over 10 years, helping grow that investment center. And you can see a, a nice photo of the lab that they put together there with the, the ticker and the, the various terminals. So again, um, we, we do want to encourage questions. So as we get going through this, uh, don't hesitate to throw in your questions, your thoughts, uh, any areas you want us to go to so we can make this kind of a, a lively and interactive conversation as, as we go here. So um, as we get started here, I'm going to just fire out some questions here, get our panel involved, and I'll start with you, Kevin. Uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about your lab, when it was opened, how many positions you have, you know, what your connection and role with the lab is, and you know, just in general, kind of give us that 10,000-foot overview of what you're doing at Stanford. Sure. Thanks, Ryan. Um, so our lab started about three years ago, and uh, it was uh, Stanford wanted to sort of build something because they'd seen a lot of other labs coming up all over North America and decided that it was something that, that, that made sense for them. Um, and I was brought on basically at the inception uh, of the lab. And one of the useful things to know is that our build-out was really, really inexpensive. They, they took an existing classroom, um, spent about $50,000 on furniture and uh, adjusting the AV equipment a little bit. And uh, nowadays, computers are so expensive, inexpensive, you just drop, drop in 24 workstations. And we were pretty much ready to go. So I think the turnaround time from it being a full classroom to it being a lab was about six weeks. Um, keep in mind, you know, it's not the, the fanciest lab of, of all of them but uh, it was something that was uh, turnkey and ready to, to, to be deployed. Um, I've been there for three years now since the lab started, and uh, you know, it's my mandate to use the lab on my own, um, but also to get other faculty in there. Um, I was talking to Bruce before the, before the session, and I, I'd say we're at about 65-70% utilization now in terms of uh, class time. Um, we could probably get about two to four more courses in there, and we have about six to eight in there right now. Um, out of that mix, about half of them are currently sort of finance inclined. So my trading strategies course or a portfolio class or a derivatives class or a uh, investing class, those are ones that I consider to be finance lab inclined. Um, and then on the side we have a data and decisions course, which is purely using um, R and Stata to, to take a look at the data coming into companies and figuring out uh, what kinds of operating decisions should be made relative to those uh, relative to that data? Um, we have a marketing group uh, and an OIT group that uses the lab as well. So you know those are sort of the heavy hitters um, that are that are in the lab and um, and utilizing it for its resources. Um, you know we see it as a a very useful tool to to bring people in, and uh, our configuration is designed to be flexible. So we have twenty four workstations but we have 48 seats, and most classes that are in there use the 48 seats. Um, my class and a couple other very specific classes will use the 24 workstations and only 24 seats. It depends on how integrated you want people to be at the machines. Um, in terms of future growth, you know, we're, we're happy with the, the current size of the lab, and, um, and overall there's you know, a couple of faculty that, are, that I've gotten my sights on in terms of getting them to, to get in there. Um, and so that's sort of my mandate is to, to get a few more faculty in there, um, build a little bit new, uh, new curriculum, and, and then facilitate the, the student use in there. Um, in terms of quick picture, uh, operating overview, that kind of stuff, um, I'm a team of one. Um, I had you know, a bunch of undergraduate lab assistants that, that helped me out when I was in University of Toronto. Um, and I love building that team and training that team and, and working with them. Uh, realistically, I haven't had the need for one at uh, Stanford. I think one of the biggest reasons why is that uh, we're almost 100% almost uh, supporting the MBA school uh, and not the undergrads. So class sizes are a lot more manageable versus having 200 or 300 undergrads coming through the lab over a three or four day span. Um, every group that we're working with is anywhere between 30 and 50 students. Um, so I just ultimately haven't needed uh, nearly as much sort of academic uh, or, or personnel support. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's probably the, the biggest jarring difference that I've noticed here is that, is that everything got up and running really quickly and everything overall runs on a much smaller footprint than what I was used to. Um, but, you know, that actually is good for me because it means I can focus more on sort of the intellectual curriculum side of things uh, and less on the sort of organizational structure side of things. Perfect. Well, thanks for that input there, uh, Kevin. I'll uh, fire the same question at you, Jennifer. If you want to tell us a little bit about your lab, how it got started, you know, give us a quick overview and uh, where you're at with things. 
Sure. Uh, thank you for having us on. Um, the Investment Center here at Duquesne University was founded in 1998, so we are entering our 17th year, and I've been here for 12 of those. Um, I came in as the manager, and we had the founding director who was a, a, a faculty director. So our operational side was, um, I was always full-time, this position was always full-time. Uh, about seven or eight years ago, uh, that faculty director stepped down, and I became the program director of our center. Um, the, the picture that you showed at the beginning is of our second generation center. So we had another room, uh, same space, uh, but we've renovated that time uh, probably, probably about ten years ago. And we're actually in the process of the very early stages of uh, hopefully our third generation because our enrollments here at Duquesne have grown substantially. So um, what you saw were 20 stations, um, 15 forward-facing, so a traditional classroom, and five uh, private study areas, which can double into the regular classroom. So um, a very uh, traditional, it was a retrofit on a lab, like Kevin said, sometimes you can take a room and just uh, reorder it and install what you need to to make it a uh, finance lab or a trading room which is what we did. Um, I have six to eight undergraduate students. Most of the time they are finance majors, and that's really the idea. I'm looking for the students who have enough coursework behind them to, or who already know the software because of that coursework, to come in and support their fellow students and um, us in our work. I do have one graduate assistant who's helping me with uh, research, and, they, and that individual can do anything from um, keep on top of the uh, competing software, what we need to do if we make a change, um, someone who can interpret curriculum materials that we have already and uh, drop that into place with new or updated software. One of the things that we do uh, very well is from a more of a grassroots approach. Um, Kevin mentioned that their uh, student body, they serve mostly the graduate uh, student body, and I would say we're probably the opposite. So at, in our business school we have two graduate programs. One is a full-time day and then the part-time evening. Uh, so we, we, lar we serve largely the undergraduate population. Um, our students in the courses come in as early as uh, sophomore year. So we have some modules within the introductory and core courses within the curricula to uh, get those students in using the tools. Um, my background is in finance and uh, financial services and banking and then uh, I have my graduate work in education. So I did a specialty um, degree in instructional technologies which fits perfect with what we're doing here. So I do a lot of curriculum design, um, a lot of consultation, to use a fancy word, with faculty to say what is it that you want students to know? What do you want them to learn? And then backfill on uh, what we can do with the software and um, the tools that we have here. So basically the Investment Center translates those learning objectives and course goals and helps to design those projects and then supports the students and faculty in um, following through uh, on those projects. Perfect. Well, thanks for that uh, quick oversight there. Um, Bruce, I'll, I'll fire the same question to you if you want to give us a little bit of an overview of your program there at University of Delaware and the room itself. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, happy to, to be here with you. I think you and I are um, kind of becoming the senior citizens of this, uh, <laughs> this field because <laughs> we had a conversation, I think, back in 1999, mm -hmm. uh, probably after the first trading room that I think really got popular attention was built up at Bentley College in Boston by a guy named Gay, uh, uh, Jay Sultan who you uh, you got to know and we built a trading room at Baruch College uh, in 99 and I think then um, the appeal and the uh, topic area was was seen as really hot but I, you know, I have to admit there was a bit of skepticism about it too, Ryan. And I'm sure you recall that, you know, 16 years ago there was sort of this 
day trading fad and the NASDAQ was sort of rising on all these dot-com stocks and, and you know to a certain extent there was a bit of a fad in a lot of what was going on in the stock market at that time and, and individual participation in the stock market maybe being motivated by uh, incorrect, uh, kind of incorrect assumptions, sort of short-term returns look great, people thought day trading was, was going to be a great uh, money generator for them. And I think what's been good over time is the, the technology of these labs has kind of stood the test of time, but I think those sort of fads that really were not ever supported by any kind of academic or capital markets theory is, has faded. So I think we really do have students and faculty now that understand the point of having one of these labs and I think in the early days you couldn't assume that you know you had to assume that there was pretty large skeptical audience out there that just thought you were kind of surfing the you know NASDAQ day trading wave and I think we've, we've proven that these labs really do have a vital role in business schools and that the impact on student learning is is impressive if they're managed correctly um, as a dean now, and I've been the dean here at University of Delaware for three and a half years, you know, I have to, I have to pay for the lab, and it puts you in a different perspective. Um, you know, when you get the bill from Bloomberg and some of the technology vendors, and we put in new screens, so you can see behind me, we just installed three large flat panels, and we've got our tickers that are probably due for an update, but um, you don't have to take too long to justify it when you see that the faculty are bought in and I think it's a real big step that Stanford offered Kevin this position because I was starting to see a little bit of a schism between you know maybe what Jennifer and I would call sort of the top you know the top 20 schools and then schools like Baruch and Duquesne and, and uh, University of Delaware where you know, we're, we're aspiring to be a top 20 school, but in the past, the top 10 schools seem to kind of turn their noses up at trading labs. It looked a little too vocational and not really what you wanted to be teaching a Harvard student or a Wharton student or a Stanford student. And I think we've, we've won that battle, too, and I think Kevin is, is proof of that. So what we've, uh, what we've got here at University of Delaware is a lab. Um, in total, we've got 40 stations, 40 seats. The classroom part of our room holds 32 students at a time at 16 uh, stations, and then there's the instructor's podium. You can see, though, we've got a dual, I don't know if you can see this, dual screen monitors, so the ergonomics are pretty good for two people to share a workstation, and we, we, we kind of like that, um, that there's some collaboration. I guess if you have a uh, a smaller class, you could spread the students out one per machine, but we're typically using two per machine. And I think the other thing we discovered is the spillover room is very important, and maybe you could talk about that at Duquesne and Stanford, uh, Jennifer and Kevin, is you begin to integrate the trading lab into your curriculum. Faculty start assigning projects where the students need to get some data from FactSet or do something on Bloomberg and if there's a class going on the students can get frustrated because they've got a homework assignment where they need to use lab resources and um, the rooms engaged. So we've got a spillover room uh, kind of off to my right here that's um, glassed in so the students back there can be talking even if a class is taking place and I think we can seat about a dozen maybe 15 students up there and we've got eight extra stations. So the combination of the two I find is, is uh, quite powerful. So we're, um, we're very, uh, you know, I think our, our penetration rate with the faculty here at Learner is very good. Um, I would say um, we have probably half a dozen classes that only meet in the trading lab any semester. So every single session of those classes takes place here and then we probably have about 15 uh, to 20 classes where maybe every fifth class the, the, the um, students will come to the room with the professor. So, you know, we kind of have um, a range of ways to draw the faculty into the room. And kind of like Kevin was saying, probably some of those uses don't necessarily require the finance lab tools that we have but I think the students uh, always um, like coming in here to do a hands-on exercise. A class in here is usually 
one they look forward to, and uh, even if they're not necessarily um, using the, the high-end finance tools in here, they, they like to be in the room. Perfect. Well, thanks for that. Uh, let's, let's talk a little bit about what you mentioned there with the spillover room. Uh, Jennifer, do you guys have a spillover room, and what's kind of been the response to that at your school? We do not have a separate segregated area, uh, in, in, in your words, a spillover room. Um, the five private carols that are in the back of our area can act in that way. So over time and, and certainly with the proper etiquette of using the room, we have um, trained students, so to speak, that they are welcome to use the room even if there's a class in session. Um, you know, we have... Um, accommodations for that. So they can use the quiet carol areas. And in, in, in the same respect, the faculty members who use the center to teach are aware of that etiquette, that standard that we've built. Um, I, would, I would love to have uh, the room large enough and designed, laid out in a way that we could have um, separate uh, research area, that quiet space project area. Um, the regular traditional classroom space, and then um, something that I just call the networking space. I, I think one of the uh, characteristics of our room, and I've seen it in many other rooms, is that that, that open time, that open um, unstructured, it's not a class time, it's not a uh, project-based or any kind of an instructor-led um, occasion that students are in the center, they're in the room and they're using it, or they're just here and they are networking amongst themselves, they're meeting, they're greeting, um, they're stopping in to see what's happening on the news or what's happening in the market. So it becomes a bit of a gathering uh, and a meetup place and so I like to keep the space um, flexible that way. So I'd take, I'd take the real estate if I had it for a spillover room. Um, but we've been able to manage more on an operational side with either adding hours to our operating time or staggering those classes. And, and like Bruce said, we have some people that meet here every class period and some who are in, in a one-off. It depends, too, whether it's a fall or a spring semester in the cycle of classes as well. Okay. Kevin, anything to add on kind of additional um, spillover space at, your, at Stanford? One, one story about us is that our spillover space was built before our actual lab. Um, on the main floor of our library, we have what's called a trader's pit, and that was about eight or ten terminals that had Bloomberg and some other resources, and that was, I guess, their soft version of a lab. You wouldn't have classes going on there, but you'd have students using it as a resource, and then we added the lab. So, um, and the lab's actually hidden on the third floor of our library, so it's, it's actually very, very far out of the way, uh, versus the spillover space is easily accessible on, on the first floor of the library. Um, but I certainly um, say that you know having that spillover is 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 crucial. I'm glad Bruce brought it up, and and I and I can I I can understand Jennifer's uh, issue, which is you know we we need this space, but we don't have it, and uh, and it's it's frustrating to to tell students that they can't you know come into the lab to to use the resources that are there. So you know having those five terminals at the back in private carols makes a lot of sense. Um, it's not the ideal situation, but it's certainly better than nothing. Perfect. Well, we do have a question here that came in. Um, wanting to know if there's any statistics that we can share with the administration of their school, such as, you know, what did your enrollment look like or your donors or your sponsorships before you had a lab and then after you had a lab? Um, I'll start with you, Bruce, if you want to answer that. Any interesting anecdotes you can share? Yes, uh, he, well, let's see. At Baruch College back in 1999, um, we built that lab off of um, development and fundraising. So that really didn't come out of the college's budget at all. We had uh, two uh, alumni that heard about the vision for the trading room, and we kind of marketed it to the donors as a way for Baruch College to... Um, get some visibility and attention in a very competitive New York City business school market. So you've got Columbia and NYU casting very long shadows. So I think for Baruch to do something out of the box and different in 1999 was was really good vision. And uh, it was the the dean there at the time, a man named Sid Lertzman, who uh, who reached out to me when I was on faculty at NYU and and got me to to move 20 blocks north to to Baruch. So the the 
the alums, I think if you give them the trading lab as a uh, development opportunity, if they really see the vision of the, the dean and the faculty and see that the students will be impacted, I mean, development directors love those kinds of um, those kinds of pitches because it's tangible. Um, it's uh, you know it's an obvious naming opportunity, and you can um, you know excite your alums in a way you might not with uh, you know giving a, a donation that's going to fund a faculty chair or uh, um, you know a a more back room uh, kind of activity of the college. So so I think at Baruch our development uh, results were somewhere between a million and a half and, and two million and this room at um, at Delaware was built on a initial funding uh, amount of about 700,000 from uh, Exelon, a, a local energy company that's since been acquired. So that sort of paid all the, the capital costs of getting the room going and at this point we use the college's operating budget to pay for software and uh, data but we we're comfortable with that but we do talk to um, potential sponsors to see if we could get some of the um, costs of this room uh, funded externally and it's uh, you know it's an ongoing conversation. Great. I just shared my screen here. One, one thing that I would just throw in that this is all available and published on the University Finance Lab website is we've got some stats, maybe not specific to things such as enrollment, but if you're just looking at general stats about labs, right now uh, we show about 18% of the business programs in North America have a trading lab, so we're tracking 313 labs. Um, and here's just kind of a quick map. You can get a more detailed map if you look at the directory itself. Um, and then here, if you're looking at comparing up AACSB or ACBSP schools in terms of the percentage that are accredited um, that have labs. And then we've got a few other stats here just in terms of the rough size. So right now, um, average is about 1,100 to 1,200 square feet and an average of about 28 positions. Um, got some stats out there of some of the key analytics and software programs that are used, some stats about uh, ticker displays, um, those using student managed funds. So again, nothing specific to enrollment, but there are some stats out there on the University Finance Lab site if you want to check those out. Uh, Kevin or Jennifer, anything you guys have that, to add in terms of enrollment or donor numbers based on after you guys went into lab? Um, I don't have anything specific on the donor or enrollment side other than the university itself has had uh, probably in the last six years four of our record number freshmen, incoming freshmen. So not this current year's freshmen, the previous year uh, was a record enrollment year. Um, we're a private university. We have no state funding, no public funding. Um, so right now our trading room and and I believe except for the initial grant for some software 17 years ago we have always been funded through the school's operational budgets so tuition which is in, in our institution very largely tuition driven so um, but I think that really represents some of the things that Duquesne does well so it's a very student centered focus um, you know, there are other schools that have very research-driven programs. Um, and I think having seen many other trading rooms, our rooms reflect what we do well. So I'm not sure that, th that the room was built with the stated intention to increase enrollment or increase funding. I think it was um, very much meant to reflect what we were doing in the classroom and to expand on that. So I think the best analogy uh, that I use as well with recruiting uh, groups that come through parents, students, uh, all the way up to donors and administrators is that this room is like a chemistry lab in a science program. So you're going to be in a uh, classroom learning theory, learning the ideas and the methodology, and then you would expect to go into a lab session and actually work with the tools and the compounds. So I think it's an evolution in business school programs that you have a space like this. So it's a it's it's your lab to use the word um, 
that, that we use trading uh, uh, finance labs, trading rooms, things like that. Um, so the, the room itself in, in our case has not been funded uh, by donors or large grants. Um, we take it. Um, we can probably name you some prices if anyone's out there interested. <laughs> Perfect. Um, one, I guess, clarification question uh, came up as a follow-up is they're asking about the stats that I put up there, if that was just things that University Finance Lab as a group had been part of or if it's all labs. And it's all labs. We're, we're trying to collect data on everything we're aware of in North America. So those stats are comprehensive of all labs that we're aware of. Okay. Um, I'm going to jump to a, a little bit more just about the student learning and how to use the labs. So I want to get your feedback on what type of classes or topics are best suited for labs. And I'll start with you, Kevin. Any thoughts on what type of classes are best? Um, obviously, you know, the lab's purpose is, is experiential learning. So anything where you're physically getting them to, to work on the terminals and do things uh, is what's going to be the most uh, conducive to lab learning. Um, from, from my perspective, when I bring a, a brand new group of students into the lab, I always tell them that what, the way they're going to learn things is very different. Um, you know, they're not going to learn by listening to me talk. And so I, I think basically all, all topics can be turned into an experiential learning kind of uh, assignment or, or uh, experience. But the, the issue is, is coming up with a, an interesting way to, to motivate the curriculum. Uh, I'll give you a quick example is, you know, we're doing a, a startup um, venture, uh, a new venture um, uh, business model type of uh, class coming up in a week. And the way that the class is typically structured is they talk about the expenses and the revenues incurred by a new business and how that all comes about. Um, and wanting to turn it into an experiential learning type of assignment, what we've done is we've built a case file where you know they come into the lab and then they're responsible for building a model in Excel. Um, hands on with 20 minutes, half an hour, working through a document. And then in class, they're being told, okay, now imagine if you're the price that you can charge for your product is actually half of what you initially planned. Um, how are you going to adjust your model? How are you going to adjust your expenses to, to match that to make it work? Um, and then they work with their teammates, um, play with the model, try to come up with the results. And they're going to come up with a lot of very logical results that make sense uh, on paper. But then when they present them to the rest of the class, it'll be like, well, you actually can't you know, pay your people under minimum wage. Sure, the model says that you know, you're financially solvent, but in reality, that's not going to work. Um, so you know, that used to be just a one and a half hour lecture in a classroom talking about how to balance your books and how to you know, do some scenario analysis or, or, or some very sensitive analysis on variables, whereas we've taken that and made it a very, very hands-on experience. Um, and that basically goes for almost every single topic that I've seen which is take something that is typically taught in a classroom and, and make it into something that's really alive and then bring it into the room and then have the students work on it. Perfect. Uh, Jennifer, I'll throw the same question at you. Any suggestion as to types of classes or topics that work really well in the lab environment? Well, actually, um, you know, the, the standard would be the, the finance courses. Um, perfect, natural fit. Um, and then certainly by extension any of the economics. So I, I suggest the early economics, uh, the micro, the macro, um, statistics courses, which in our curricula is um, sophomore year. Our, our business core really starts on the sophomore year uh, first semester. So actually tomorrow I will have those intro to stats or the stats one students in. Um, it's, a, it's a fairly straightforward experience for them to gather the data they need uh, into Excel and then be able to take that data and do the statistical studies that they need to do. Um, we also have some gateway courses that we have experiences in the center. Um, and then our investment club is really where um, many of our non-finance students will get a, uh, extensive experience in, in the center. Um, but the way I put it is that our, our program is completely aligned with the finance uh, program. But we're not exclusively aligned with finance. So I think both Kevin and Bruce mentioned that you know there's, that there are always some non-finance faculty who are interested here. And while the finance courses have deeper experiences in the center, 
um, I have probably as many non-finance faculty who do one-off or every couple of weeks an experience in the center. Um, so uh, it, it's been our tradition here that the room was open to anyone who was interested and who had a, um, you know, an idea to execute in their class something interesting, something um, memorable for the students. Perfect. Same question to you, Bruce. Uh, any thoughts on topics or classes that are a good fit for the lab? Yeah, sure. I, I liked um, Kevin's characterization a lot to, to get it in the faculty's mind that you know, the room is not to teach some topic that we never touched before we had these labs. You're just trying to kind of apply that, that flipped classroom concept that you hear about where you know, rather than uh, you standing up in front of a whiteboard, you know, writing down uh, information and ideas that, you know, you assume the students are getting and, and it turns out they actually don't learn well that way. What you try to do is bring them into the classroom and have them do something that applies that concept or that learning. Um, one of the things I notice some of our most active faculty using this lab do is um, They'll put out um, a uh, Camtasia, you know, these short um, introductory videos uh, the day before a class when they'll come in here. So they might tape themselves for 10 or 15 minutes describing a certain concept and just covering all the rote materials, putting that up on our learning management system, which is called Sakai. So, you know, he, you can find out as a faculty whether people have watched it, and it turns out if you, if you require them to watch those videos, they will. They come to class with the basic ideas already covered, and you have them jump right into a hands-on exercise or experiential learning exercise right away. And, and that's, I think, the key is getting those marginal faculty members to take every topic they teach and just ask themselves the question, is it, the best way for me to teach this, being in a standard classroom with a piece of chalk in my hands, or could I flip the classroom and teach this topic in a new way? And, and we've got a, a really nice cadre of faculty that ask themselves that question and come into this lab pretty regularly. Um, a couple of the other things I jotted down that really make a class work well in the lab is if it's competitive in some sense. And, and you know, Kevin and I, and, and I suppose you too, Jennifer, we've made a lot of use of market simulations and trading simulations in our activities and in our teaching. And that's something where you're making something happen in the classroom that they wouldn't be able to do on their own and that you wouldn't be able to do outside of a, a, a good technology-enhanced facility like this. It might not have to be a trading lab, but you've got to have the connected computers to run trading simulations. And the students can be taught a number of topics while they're, you know, in a game. So they're, they're in this, this environment where you're trying to teach them something about markets, and you give them a, a competition. And that really engages the mind, as we've, we've found out, to, to recognize that, you know, you're trying to do something and you're going to be assessed, there's going to be this almost immediate feedback on how you're doing, um, you, you learn well in that environment. So thinking of ways you can take any topic and, and put the, the, the students into teams and kind of have them uh, compete to get the best results. You know, a friendly competition um, I think works well. So uh, classes that have interaction uh, as well as competition, those work. So if you have a group of students that maybe brings one skill set to the table or they've learned something different than another group of students in the class and, and you get them to interact. And I'm sure you see some of this at Stanford, Kevin, with sort of technologists and business students that are interested in startups. You know, that interaction is really valuable. We try to do it in a lot of our trading room classes where we might have, you know, an accounting you know, a set of accounting students explaining a certain accounting treatment to a group of finance students who are analyzing balance sheets in an industry and, and have them understand what does it mean when you find companies that have very low liquidity ratios or very low, uh, you know, debt equity ratios. What does, that, what does that actually mean and how could that affect the way you analyze that company? So interaction is important. And then finally, just you know, anything that draws on wisdom of the crowd, so where you've got the students 
um, you know, maybe voting or collectively deciding something that you revisit later. So, you know, the simplest example of this is you construct some kind of a portfolio based on student voting and, you know, you see how that group um, decision compares with some benchmark, but you're bringing the, the collective wisdom of the class together in some way that all the students observe and see. And, you know, these are all things that the lab facilitates and enables, and as long as the faculty member and the lab director kind of design the, 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 the way the class is going to work, it's, it's highly successful. Um, so, so those, to me, are sort of the keys, competition, interaction, some way of drawing out the wisdom of the crowd in your class session. Bunch of interesting points there. You, you talked about um, using Camtasia for the videos. You talked about the simulation programs. Um, I'll kick it to you, Jennifer. I'm curious, what other tools are you using? Like, are you finding uh, PDF guides, video tutorials, simulation programs? What are some of the best ways to engage the students in the the lab? Well, I think it's all of the above. I think you uh, you know it speaks to the learning style of every individual student to have a plethora of media for them to, to use. So I also have a few Camtasia um, little videos more on the inst on the how-to side so somebody needs to um, get 60 months worth of data into Excel very quickly and um, you know we can produce something like that and get that out to the individual professors to load into uh, you use Sakai but we use um, Blackboard um, PDFs are probably the most popular. Um, again, something that we can shoot out to those instructors and have them give it to their students, and also that we can have on hand um, in our uh, in our room at our reception area for students to use as needed. Um, I do a lot of the how-to instructional uh, part of it in a more formal when we have more formal settings. So this would be something like a uh, we have a very lengthy, in-depth portfolio project, and um, the professor will use the lab to introduce the project, kind of set the stage for it. He get, you know, they have their instruction sheet, but then coming in support of that professor, I will schedule 10 to 15 one-hour sessions throughout a two-week period for students to come in on their time um, to be able to get that hands-on, um, you know, where they can work independently but have the support when they need it. Um, so we, we do a combination of that. Okay. I'll kind of throw the same thing at you, Kevin. Any of those tools uh, very similar to what Bruce and Jennifer described that you guys are using at Stanford? Yeah, we, we seem to be using the PDFs the most frequently. Um, I think video is, I, I prefer to use video as a user, but as someone who makes this stuff, I don't like making video because I'm very picky about having the presentation value be sort of pristine and so recording myself talk sort of drives me crazy because I stutter here or there and then I have to record it all over again. Um, so, you know, it's also from a, from a, a deployment standpoint, um, I think it's easier for an individual to consume a video, uh, but I think when you're in a lab setting it's not as easy, you know, we don't have uh, speakers uh, installed in our computers at, in, in, our op in, in, our, in our lab. Um, I think that would actually be quite uh, troublesome if everyone's there, you know, playing music or, or listening to videos. So, so although video seems like an obvious one, I have yet to see it extensively used. Uh, even though, whenever I'm looking at a new product or looking at software, I don't want to read a PDF. I want to just watch a video for five minutes and see what it does, and then move on. So, I think I'm at odds with that right now, trying to figure out um, what's gonna what's gonna make the most sense. Perfect. Um, so, quick question for each of you. Ryan, can I interject? Maybe, sure, fire Yeah, maybe um, what I said about video was misunderstood. I don't mean the students are here in the lab using the video. What I'm saying is the professor will create the video, have the students watch it before they show up. So it's sort of like a, you know, a gradual introduction. So when they come into the lab, they kind of hit the ground running. They've already seen, you know, let's say the Bloomberg screen or you know, if we're going to do a trading simulation, you know, we'll have a video that will explain how an order book market works. And that will be on video. So when they come in, we can more quickly jump into the simulation or the competition or the exercise. So I think the videos are sort of the, um, 
you know, the, the off, you know, the, the thing that students do, you know, rather than homework, let's say, to prepare for the class session. And then the class session will be a competition. So the students, in effect, are, you know, motivated to watch that video and make sure they really understand what the assessment is going to be when they come into the class. I, I, I'm with Kevin. I don't want sound in my, uh, in my lab. I want it to be a pretty hushed place. But I, um, I think Kevin's also a perfectionist, and I know exactly what he's talking about. I hate videos that I make. Um, but I realize it's much better just to put out one that's imperfect and give the students the background so that the class, um, they come into class, you know, prepared and knowledgeable rather than the alternative. So, so um, get over it, Kevin. I think you can, uh, you can make good videos, I promise. Perfect. Um, so I got a couple of questions that came in here via email that are pretty short, and I'll pass them around. First is optimal size of a lab, and the second is, do any of you put certifications on your syllabus along with the curriculum? So I'll start that with you, Kevin. Uh, optimal size of classes, and do you use any kind of certifications? Um, I, I, you know, I think for the optimal size, anywhere between that 20 to, to 50 range is your, is your sweet spot. Um, I think when you start to get larger than 50 or 60, um, classroom management becomes a serious problem, which is that People are working on things, and um, with lab experiments and with lab um, uh, assignments, you often have to work at the pace of the slowest person in the room. And so as you get more and more people, then that slowest person becomes uh, incrementally slower relative to the rest of the class. Um, it's not something that, like a lecture where if someone missed a note, they just ignore it and they keep writing the other stuff. If someone misses a step in, in the whole process, it's difficult to just say, oh, I'm sorry, you didn't, you know, click the buttons fast enough, and now you're completely excluded from the next 10 to 20 minute kind of exercise. Um, so, so that's in terms of size. In terms of, um, in terms of, sorry, the second thing was... Certification. So they want to know if there's any kind of certification on your syllabus that goes along with the classes in the lab. Um, sorry, I'm still confused. Is that like Bloomberg certification? Like you need to have Bloomberg certification before you take the class? or I, I think that's what they're alluding to. Okay. Um, we don't do anything like that. Uh, we certainly have prerequisites. You know, you have to have your, your basic uh, finance or your basic economics courses before you take these specific classes. Um, we recommend the certifications. I try to stay as platform agnostic as possible. So I don't want to like force people to use a specific application uh, or get a specific certification before they take the class. OK. Uh, Jennifer, any optimal sizes or anything around certifications you're doing in your lab? Um, as far as size, uh, our classes in the business school are capped between 35 and 40. So. Um, in, in the lab as we have now, I would say we can push to 25 or 30 students, even though we, we have 20 stationary uh, seats, we can bring in the you know, extra chairs to have people double up, especially if it's a group project. And, and we will shoehorn people in for um, you know, those one-time classes where you know, it's not, their comfort for that one and a half hours is not the primary um, driver of, you know, the space in the room. Um, so I, I like to think forward. If we had to redo this room, I would have 40. 40 would be probably, and, and that's right in Kevin's range, um, you, you know, assuming the space is designed appropriately, you can get to 40 people fairly easily, uh, you know, if, if it was just one instructor. Okay. Um, on the certification side, we do have um, Bloomberg, uh, well now they're not calling it certification, it's their essentials training. We, but as a generic term, yes, we do um, have certification on, uh, on the syllabus as a requirement for our portfolio course, which all finance majors take. <clears throat> and then in our economics curriculum, the students will work on uh, the, the Bloomberg certification as well. So essentially all finance and all econ majors are getting certified and, and in many cases more than one level so those four market sector um, designations, equity, fixed income, currency, and commodities, most of the students will do more than one of those. Um, 
We get very good anecdotal feedback from folks out in the uh, banking world, especially, that they like the students. It's not that they know Bloomberg inside and out or any other piece of software inside and out, but they have a familiarity with it and a comfort level that, you know, Bloomberg being probably one of the more interesting platforms to learn, um, that they're comfortable jumping on and using that. Um, but I do agree with you, Kevin, that I don't like to promote just one piece of software. So I will, I would encourage all of those other vendors out there to have some sort of an onboard training program. We would push that out to all of the classes in which that was appropriate. I would love to be able to do that. Okay. Well, we've got about 10 minutes left here, and there are a couple of other questions that came in, so I'll, I'll jump to these, and I'll, I'll start with you, Bruce, on this one. Um, question is, you know, the, often faced with, you know, why do I need a trading lab to teach a class? And wondering if you have any insight as to um, how these types of rooms help the students in the learning process and, you know, and out in the real world seeking jobs. Well, um, I think the, the, the point Kevin made about the cost of setting up a lab today is, is a really good one. I mean, it, these were very expensive propositions back in the 90s because the, the equipment, the furniture you wanted to buy to make it look good, the cost of each PC was, was you know, three four $4,000. So the price, though, has come down. If, if you're going to have a nice PC lab, and that's you know something you want to have in your business school building, there's a very small incremental cost to making it a finance lab. So I would sort of argue to, to anybody in an administrative role, you know, at least look at that possibility of, of using your, your computer lab as, as the finance lab. You'll get a lot more visibility and mileage out of it. Um, you know, do you need to do this in a classroom? I'm starting to, to believe you do because, you know, with video tools and with online learning, I think we're starting to get a, a, a sense that you can kind of segment all the different modes of learning today. And, you know, there are a lot of things that can be taught well online or via video and, and some kind of interactive student exercises that they can do remotely outside of a classroom. But there's still something special that happens in education when you put a group of people together to learn a topic or a concept that's not rote and where there's really a, a need for judgment and interpretation. And I think what we're really learning about, you know, a lot of business subjects, including finance, is, is what the, you know, what the recruiters are really looking for is not somebody who's just trained in sort of the standard knowledge and formulas you need, but really understands the nuances and how to apply those and how to be, be persuasive with other people. Um, and I think our, our finance labs provide that. And, um, you know, I, I, I'd say what, you know, I think successful educators are doing now is looking at all those different modes of learning um, and making sure that the finance lab plays its role kind of at the, the top of the food chain there. But, uh, you know, I would say for, for a business school that wants to emphasize finance programs and, and wants to have its students having opportunities in the financial services sector, these labs, I think, are now a necessity. Okay. Interesting question that just came in is um, it's coming more from the IT side of things. So they want to know if there's cases where labs have been initiated by non-business departments. Uh, the IT says they're interested in these kind of tools, but the business programs are very trans, uh, very territorial and non-transparent. Any, uh, I guess, advice to an IT side that wants to maybe do some of this and they're having trouble with people staking out too much territory on the business side of things? Um, I'll let you field that one. Kevin, any thoughts? Um, I really believe in sharing, and, like, I, th I think that the territorial issue... Um, I think it's more of an administrative thing than an actual reality. Um, it's one of those things that if your space is so busy that people can't use it when they want to use it, then, then that's a problem that, that you deal with, or it's, it's a good problem to have. Um, and I often say, you know what, I, I, I say, oh, you know, we'll get there, and it's a good problem to have when we get there, and then we get there, and we're like, okay, it's actually not a good problem to have. But um, it's, it's a problem that, you know, I, I think it takes a long time to get your utilization up to where you need to be. So I think pretty much every single time people look at one of these facilities and then they forecast, oh, you know, who's actually going to use the lab? And 
you know, 15 faculty members say, oh, yeah, yeah, I plan to use it, I plan to use it. In reality, your attrition rate is so high that um, territorialness or, or overutilization is, is rarely an issue, at least for the first two to five years of a lab, um, arguably longer for many. Um, Ryan, you know, you've seen a, a lot of these sort of white elephant labs where they built the lab and then basically within two years of that. Um, and that's certainly the more common situation. And it's not something that I promote, not something that I want to happen. But, um, you know, everyone comes in wanting or thinking that, that, it's, that it's going to be uh, extremely well utilized. And, and in principle, and, and in theory it is, but when it comes down to the practicality of uh, faculty having to readjust their curriculum, faculty having to, you know, work with a, a slightly different schedule than what they might want to do, um, and ultimately learn a new way to teach something, um, you know, there's a significant drop off. So I, I would say if there is issues with that, I, I would say embrace those issues, which is you've got another group that's willing to uh, foot some of the bill. And um, if, if there are issues with, you know, both groups wanting to use it too much, then, then go with that after the bill is used. Okay. Jennifer, I'll, I'll throw it to you. Anything to add to that or anything you've done to help get faculty to embrace the lab or any issues with transparency and sharing what's going on with non-business programs? Um, well, we do have quite a, uh, a, a slate of, I call them non-curricular um, or outside of the business school programs. So um, usage has never been a problem here. Now we're on the other end where, you know, usage is approaching our capacity, if not more, in many cases. Um, I don't know that we've ever had any territorial issues. Um, I'd like to think that having that full-time professional manager, program director, the person who sits in my seat, somebody like Kevin, and at uh, University of Delaware, Bruce, your, your colleague, Rich, you, you know, that would be the responsibility of that designated lab champion to, to figure out who who needs to do what and when and make it happen and to be very politically savvy when it comes to dealing with um, the funding issues, the territory issues, and then getting the support that you need for the lab. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question expressly, but I hope it leads to the, to the um, very strong recommendation that I believe um, you need to have that full-time designated professional person, whether they're our faculty member or not, but it is their primary responsibility to shepherd and champion the lab um, to make sure those things don't become an issue. Perfect. The quick note, Ryan, to add is that um, when I was in Toronto, one, one thing that we came up with, which I thought was pretty clever, was we had a whole bunch of groups that wanted to use the lab space, um, and they kind of expected to do it for free. And so what we did was we actually went through and, and did a relatively transparent, this is what our operating costs look like. And if you want to use the lab for your classes, you know, we're going to charge your, your, your department, you know, $200 for each session. And it's on a purely cost recovery basis. Um, and at least that helped them a little bit in terms of if they were like, you know, we really want to use the space, we're like, fine, like, help us cover the, the cost of these terminals. You know, I'm not going to make you pay for the Bloomberg software because I'm not using that, but at least um, understand that there's an element. And then it's not just an issue of pure territorialism of, well, I'd rather have the space and the optionality to use the space than to let other people use it. Um, and we felt better because we, we recovered some of our costs, which, you know, ultimately makes things easier in our budgets, too. So, you know, that was a um, method that worked out quite well for us. Okay. Well, we're up against the hour here. Um, I do want to give each of you a chance just to kind of do closing thoughts, your quick 60, 90 seconds of closing thoughts for anything that maybe you want to drive a point home or expand on something that, you know, maybe we didn't cover. So I'll start with you, Bruce. Any closing thoughts you want to leave our viewers with? Yeah, sure, Kat. Um, sure, Ryan. I think um, the 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 school that's thinking about a lab like this, and it's a totally new idea, they kind of need to get their head around the idea that a lot of the technologies that you're going to have in these rooms are really designed for professionals. So you get kind of used to, in higher education, a lot of tools that are built for students, and uh, that there's a pretty easy entrance ramp. Whereas a lot of the tools we use here, you've got to figure out a way to take a professional tool that's not designed for a professor, not designed for students. They're designed for people sitting in a bank or at a trading firm that are going to be using that tool, you know, 8, 10, 15 hours a day. 
And that's a real skill, and I think Jennifer was kind of hitting at it before, that you need to have a lab champion that's able to bridge what the student educational experience um, should be with the fact that Bloomberg and Morningstar and FactSet and, and Capital IQ are not um, like using, uh, you know, Yahoo. They're, they're designed for professional users, so you've got to be ready, not just with the technology in the room, but with the people. And, uh, you know, I think Kevin also said, you know, you'll have 20 people on the faculty express an interest and the attrition rate is going to be 80%, so you're left with four. So make sure you factor in there's going to be dropouts, but I think if you can get a good uh, lab director who is probably an instructional track faculty member ideally to be that champion and get those first three or four people on board, the, um, the hurting effect will kick in and you'll wind up with, with a, a good number using it. And, and I think the good problem that Jennifer and Kevin alluded to, which is the room is in so much use, people start complaining about not getting access. Perfect. Jennifer, any closing thoughts on your end? I would just say um, if, if you're thinking of building this kind of an environment where you have this environment and you want to improve the usage or the, the, the presence of it, is to really make sure that you treat it like what it is. It's a pedagogical tool. And it's not just a computer lab that's got some fancy ticker software and uh, a few Bloomberg's or Morningstar software in there. It needs to be treated with the level of um, a, a level of professionalism, and that it is an integrated pedagogical tool designed to help students bridge the gap between what they're learning in the classroom and having some truly applied, real experience with the tools and the uh, the information that they that you want them to retain. Perfect, Kevin. Closing thoughts on your end. Um, main closing thought is you, you showed your map uh, of the finance labs in North America and the West Coast is just like very, very, very sparse. <laughs> and so I, I implore my, my West Coast colleagues um, to, to pick up the slack and uh, open up more labs. I'm more than happy to, to help you out, give you some feedback, give you some tips on getting things started. Um, but I think, I think we want to see more uh, expansion in that area. Perfect. Well, with that, uh, we definitely appreciate everyone's time uh, attending today. Uh, again, we hope to do these monthly, uh, circulating a, a bunch of different people, different perspectives, and uh, sharing best practices to help everyone get better and more use out of their finance labs. So, uh, Bruce, Jennifer, Kevin, thank you so much for contributing your uh, your time and your thoughts today. Uh, we all definitely appreciate it. Thanks, Ryan, for setting us up.